Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve the deeds of beloved from you. God of might, wisdom, and virtue, please assist us in this and govern the nations. With your Holy Spirit, count and confirm us. May your guide and your divine wisdom guide our steps and guide us all. May your spirit guide us all. Land of the free by the carriage sea, our manhood we fled to thy liberty. No tyrants here linger, best parts must be in tranquil heaven of democracy. The blood of our side, hallowed the sun, brought freedom from slavery. By the might of truth and the grace of God, no longer shall we be years of wood. Arise, the son of the heavens clan, put on your armor, You can kindly take a seat. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Teachers Constitution Education Forum. At this time, I will be establishing protocol. Chair Anthony Chanona, Chair of the People's Constitution Commission, Vice Chair Glenfield Dennison of the People's Constitution Commission, Mr. Cesar Ross, Director of Good Governance, Mr. Ed Usher, Attorney at Law, Mr. Sotero Cruz, Educator, Commissioner Ruth Schumann, President BNTU, Commissioner Jorge Mejia, First Vice President BNTU. At this time, I would like to invite Mr. Sotero Cruz for the welcome address. 
Mr. Cruz has been a teacher for over 35 years. He was a primary school teacher between Sartaneja and here in Corozal at the St. Francis Xavier Primary School and also did some years at CJC. He retired in 2001 and is a founding member of the BNDU. Give a round of applause for Mr. Sotero Cruz. Good morning. I salute you all in the name of all the retired teachers to remind you that many of us are still here, some of us walking slower than a few years ago, having problems with our ears and our eyes, our sight. We are still here and we are still interested in what is going on in our country. And also to tell you teachers that we got your back. Thank you. And I must tell you today that I, as I read the information on the booklet about what is going on, you know, it suddenly dawned on me that this occasion is far more important than what I had previously thought. That this exercise that will be carried out today here is most crucial for everybody. We all know that reforming or changing the constitution of a country is not something that is done every day and is not done easily. We all know that our constitution, what our constitution is, and therefore we can definitely realize how doing that is a great responsibility of a people. So I invite you all to welcome this opportunity of being a part of this process. Well, let's do it as proper as possible. It may not seem so obvious, but this will be a part of our history, and you all will be a writer in this history. This was clear to me when I read at the, that at the end of this consultation, the people will have a say as to what will happen. Therefore, I urge you all to make this occasion a very fruitful one, and for we may have a great opportunity to create a far better society and country in the near future. With that, I extend my most cordial and warm welcome to our presenters, to our visitors, to the head table, to you all. P please feel most welcome, and uh, let's do it right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. As he mentioned, this is a historic event and we do encourage your participation in giving opinions, suggestions, and answering questions, asking questions after presenters have done their presentations. At this time, we call for the chairman, Anthony Shanona, for the overview and the introduction of presenters. Thank you very much, Mistress of Ceremonies. Protocol having been established, I would just like to begin this brief presentation by first of all, apologizing to you for standing in line and thanking you for your patience, thanking you for your presence. We are, this is the first leg of a countrywide tour with our teachers and we are certainly going to try to do a better job um, with managing your time. I'm from Belmopan. My name is Tony Chanuna. Before I go into the, the brief overview of why we are here, and because you are teachers, I thought I would just share with you a few 
constitutional facts on constitutions. There's over 194 countries that have adopted constitutions as a way to govern their nation. This is a document that marries justice with power, political power with justice, and that brings harmony to a nation and to a people. When that is not in balance, there is discord. Of the 194 countries that have adopted constitutions, two countries stand out of having the smallest constitution, and smallest meaning number of words. So the state of Monaco, Monaco and Japan vie for having the smallest constitutions. Monaco's constitution has 12 chapters and contains 318 words. The constitution of Japan has 11 chapters and 4,000 words. India has the largest constitution, 146,385 words and 25 chapters. Closer to home, we have 163 pages, 13 chapters. I'm going to leave a trivia question and you will be given a prize. Log on to the PCC website. I would like to ask teachers as an assignment, how many words are in the Belize Constitution? In 42 years, which we celebrate this year, next month, we have amended this constitution 10 times. The United States, by comparison, over the course of 234 years, have amended their constitution only 27 times. But there's been 11,000 attempts to change it. Of all the constitutions in the world, the hardest constitution to change is the American constitution. Here is food for thought going into this session as you open your minds to what is going to be presented. Should the Belize constitution be easy to change or should any changes to this constitution be put to the people in a referendum. Especially when we're finished with this exercise and it goes to a referendum, what's the next step with changes? Think about it. I go quickly into my overview. The People's Constitution Commission has a statute, a law. It's called the PCC Act Number 28 of 2022. We, along with 23 other commissioners, 25 other commissioners of 23 organizations, are charged to do two things in law. What you see happening today, we are to consult with the people of Belize after comprehensively reviewing the constitution. We took nine months to get ourselves orientated on this. After consulting with the people of Belize, and we've harvested your views, your comments, your recommendations, your opinions, we are to put that into a report called the final report, and we are to give it to the Prime Minister in May 2024. That's 18 months. The law provides for an extension. We are trying our best to meet that deadline. May 2024, we give the Prime Minister a report that says the people of Belize would like these things changed, repealed, amended in their constitution. That's where this process ends. So your comments and your feedback in today's session is very, very important 
to the work of the Commission. And so again, I thank you for taking the time to come out. But today's session is designed to expose you as teachers to some parts of the Belize Constitution so that you in turn could pass on that knowledge to your students. We've chosen two areas of our Constitution. Mr. Usher will be presenting on the preamble and know your rights. This little booklet. And you were given a smaller booklet, a brief summary of the Constitution of Belize, written by lawyer Richard Dickey Bradley. This is 163 pages. This is 23 pages, volume one. It's a short version to try to get you to understand very complicated book. I won't profess to be any authority. Like many of you, I do not completely understand this book. So part of the education of our people, before we ask them what they want to change in this book, we thought we should let them know at least what, what it contains. And this booklet is an effort to do that. We have other booklets as part of this education campaign. Students who have a greater knowledge of how we are governed will make for a better nation. One of the things that Director Cecil Ross has been charged with is to update a 1969 version, sorry, um, of how we were governed and along with the Ministry of the Education, we are going to try to introduce this as part of the curriculum into the schools. So long after May 2024 finishes, this booklet is now going to be taught in the schools as part of the curriculum. A nation of young persons having a knowledge of the way they are governed will make for a better Belize. We cannot lose sight of that fact. But why is this knowledge important? Constitutions declare the identity of a nation, its institutions. The preamble to the Belize Constitution, which is regarded among all by comparison to be one of the best, declares the supremacy of God. Canada is another country that has a similar declaration. We affirm that all our laws must be founded upon spiritual and moral values. The preamble and this declaration is the bedrock on which we build our identity as a people and as a nation. It is foundational pay close attention to your preamble. It also prescribes your rights, your inalienable rights as a child of God. Being born a Belizean automatically makes you qualify. Should some of these rights be expanded? These are some of the questions we hope to harvest from you. But how did we get here? Some people say this thing is a papishu, a charade. I would want to convince you that this is one of the most important exercises our nation has ever taken on in 42 years. We, this generation of Belizeans, are a part of writing our history. Thanks to the government of Belize, and because they promised in Plan Belize a manifesto to do this, we have an opportunity to look at how we are governed and say, I don't like this, I would like this changed. This has never happened in our country. Welcome to history and welcome to writing your legacy. I close on this note. The Right Honorable George Cadle Price, many call him the father of our nation, the father of our constitution, had this to say. 
I believe that a country's first duty is to set its own house in order. And having set its own house in order, it can contribute better to the community of the world as a strong link rather than a weak link. Thanks to those words, we must rise to this challenge. Thank you very much. I will go quickly into the agenda. You have it there? Because of time, we would like to introduce our first presenter, Ed Peter Usher. Would you like to come up, Pedro? Ed Peter Usher is a citizen of Belize. He's a graduate of Wellesley College in Belize City and the Royal Military Academy in the United Kingdom. He holds a bachelor degree in law from the University of Guyana and a master's degree of law in legislative drafting from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. <clears throat> Good morning. Buenos dias. My um, duty today is to share with you the preamble and the protection of your fundamental rights. But as I have done in several presentations throughout the country, I found it important that we speak a little bit about the supremacy of the Constitution. So before I get into the fundamental rights, which is the substantive area or part of this presentation, I would like to speak a little bit about the preamble and about the supremacy of the Constitution. And when I do start with the fundamental rights, you shall see the wisdom in speaking a little bit about the supremacy of the Belize Constitution. Just to add to what the chairman said earlier, the Constitution is the most important document that we will read in this country, to my mind. It contains the basic principles and laws of this nation on the state, and it determines the powers and duties of the government, and it guarantees and protects the rights of the persons in it. Please note I said the persons in it and not necessarily only the citizens. The reason will come to light presently. The Belize Constitution came to life on the 21st of September 1981. It has 163 pages, 13 parts, 145 sections, and four schedules. Or schedules, some people say tomato, some say tomato. Some say schedules, some say schedules. The preamble, the preamble of the Belize Constitution is the first introductory words as it relates to our Constitution. As the chairman rightfully alluded to earlier, the first few lines of our Constitution speaks to the supremacy of God. The Canadian Constitution said it, as Mr. Chanona rightfully stated, and even the great United States, one part of their, uh, this children says it every morning before they go to class, and it says, 
they acknowledge the supremacy of God, freedom, justice, etc. And so Belize is not unique when we acknowledge the supremacy of God. Now, in several of my previous presentations, persons have asked about what about secular, what about the separation of the church on one hand and the state on the other. Well, it depends on how you look at secularism. Belize is secular in a sense because the government cannot say that this religion or that religion should be the national religion. So then they ask, well, how does it say Belize acknowledges the supremacy of God? Yes, it acknowledges the supremacy of God, but it does not tell you if you are a Methodist or a Catholic or a Muslim or an Anglican that your God is not the God that you, that you should be believing in. So it is not saying to you, for the loss of better words, which God? Is it the Muslim God or the uh, Buddhist God or Hindu gods? It says, Belize accept the supremacy of God, whichever God you, you or whichever religious persuasion you are from. So that is the difference between a total secular state or uh, a state that says which God we are going to be speaking to. And I don't want to mention any country in particular, but you all know which countries deal very strongly in theocracy. They have a theocratic government, and we leave it at that. So in our preamble then, the argument came that these beautiful words, this flowery language that starts, that opens the Constitution, the argument was whether these words actually formed a part of the Constitution. And in a case that was decided by Chief Justice Conte, as he then was, he said yes. It was the case with Barry Bowen and some other landowners that were claiming they should have a piece of the pie, if you will, or royalty, if oil or other uh, substances like that was found under their property. And one of the lawyers was using the, some of the wording in the preamble uh, to substantiate his argument. And the other contended, no, the preamble is not a part of the Constitution. Well, the preamble, according to that case by Chief Justice Conte, it is a part of the Constitution. So, the Constitution, like I said, affirms that the nation of Belize shall be founded on principles which acknowledge the supremacy of God, recognizes faith in human rights and fundamental freedoms. It says that the principles of social justice, oh, sorry, the principles of social justice, and if you listen and re remember the words that we stated when we recited the Belize National Prayer er earlier, you see that there was a line in there that says social justice the increase of industry, sobriety, and so on. So social justice. The next area that I would just like to touch on briefly, it says that the Constitution shall state that there is equal protection should be given to children regardless of their social status. There was a time back in the past when children born out of wedlock was bastards in quotation mark oh you're you know bound a wedlock you're a bastard what the constitution says here in the preamble equal protection should be given to children regardless of their social status and because belize is a signatory one of the first signers of the united nations conventions on the rights of children one of that one of the clauses in that convention states something to this effect and so in our families and children's act chapter 173 of the laws of belize also has a section 
which says that all children shall be dealt with equally under the law. It also provides that Belize shall be a democratic country and we have peaceful transitions of uh, govern governance once every five years. We have city councils and town council uh, elections. The preamble speaks to that. The preamble up until 2001 did not provide for the rights of indigenous people in Belize and so the Constitution was amended in 2001 to provide, and I quote, the right to work, pursuit of happiness, protection of identity, dignity, social and cultural values of Belizeans, including Belize's indigenous peoples. So it was amended in 2001 to provide for that. Now, like I said, I want to move to fundamental rights. I'm getting there slowly. But I need to look at the supremacy clause. And the reason for the supremacy clause and why I am teething some of your time to discuss a little bit about supremacy of the Constitution is because to my mind and to my limited knowledge of the Constitution, the supremacy clause is what holds the second branch of government, the legislature, in its place. The supremacy clause says, and I will paraphrase, that the constitution shall be the supreme law of Belize and any other law that is inconsistent with the constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void. Again, because this is very important. If you understand this, you will see why the Constitution has teeth. A little bit about the second arm of government, just quickly. There are three arms of government. You as teachers, I know that you are aware, so this will be like a little review, should in case it comes up in a question. There are three arms of government. The executive branch, which executes the law. The executive branch includes the cabinet, Commissioner of Police, Controller, Customs, the ex executive or the, exec the ex executory or the executive branch of government. And then the, after the executive branch comes the legislative branch. The legislative branch creates the law, the parliament, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then finally the judicial branch. So what is important with the Supremacy Clause? It is important because it says that not Parliament, nor the House of Representatives or the Senate shall be the Supreme. The Supremacy lies in the Constitution. Section 2 says, this Constitution shall be the Supreme Law of Belize and any other law that is inconsistent with the Constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. So, Parliament cannot wake up tomorrow and say, well, the Catholic religion shall be the only religion in Belize. That will have immediate constitutional challenge because the Constitution guarantees Belizeans a right to their own religion of choice, to change religion when they feel like, to propagate the religion, spread it, and to come back to the religion if they may leave the religion and they could come back if they want. And then, of course, there are those exceptions. We can discuss that a little bit later. So the supremacy of the Constitution is very important indeed. Now, we go to the juicy part of why we are here this morning as it relates to my presentation. The fundamental rights. The Constitution does not give you rights. You have rights. The Constitution protects those rights. If you look at part two in the Belize Constitution, you look at part two, the heading of part two 
is the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms. The protection of them. You have them already. It's protecting those rights that you have. Of course, over the discussions that I've had, seven so far, six or seven throughout the country, Belmopan, with the public service, Orange Walk, the prison, Corozal, the Creole Council, today, the national teachers, the national teachers. Um, this is interesting. First time in my life I'm speaking to such a huge group. And so if I sound a little bit nervous, you all might understand. And so fundamental rights, sec part two of the Belize Constitution provides for the protection of our fundamental rights. I was saying that when I was in Orange Walk on a presentation, a gentleman rightly asked, he said, Mr. Osha, he said, but the Constitution gives you some rights on one hand and then take it back on the next. I said, it might look that way. But the same Constitution says, and I'm paraphrasing, that no rights is absolute except one. The right not to be in servitude. There's no exceptions to that one. Even your right to life, there are exceptions. If you are convicted of uh, murder, for example, and you are sentenced to death, and you do not exceed the, the period, I think, of three years, then you could be executed by the state. You could be taken your life. Your life can be taken away. There are exceptions. And there are several others in the Constitution. But it makes sense no right is absolute. I told one man, I said, look at it this way. Your right to throw a punch and when my nose begin, unless we are boxers and I sign a waiver, but your right to throw your punch, you have a right to throw a punch. But your right to throw a punch and right yes or just before my nose, unless we are boxers, like I said, and we sign a waiver, well then you could beat me tell the ref say he's had enough. But other than that, no rights are absolute. Rights are dependent on the rights of others, public safety, national security, etc. And you will see it in the Constitution. When you read the Constitution, I want you to remember this if you remember nothing else from this presentation. Remember that when you are reading the Constitution, and you read the rights, the substantive, the substantive right, and then you might see words like notwithstanding, take and break there, notwithstanding, provided that subject to shall not be in contravention. Enter on a book up the word there, on a look on it and on a read that, that on a read the part that follows subject to notwithstanding, etc. Because what is happening is a limitation to a certain extent it is not like i said absolute so part two sections three to 19 inclusive when you go to section 20 you will see it says where a person alleges etc the right section three to 19 inclusive i am a draftsman i hold a master's in legislative drafting and when you write laws and you write words each other word have a meaning so when you say in section 20 it says sections 3 to 19 inclusive stop that the word inclusive why you you would say but why inclusive after the 3 to 9 section 3 to 19 because if you leave it at section 3 to 19 if the draftsman had done that persons a good liar arguing on behalf of whomever would say that means section 4 to 18 are included it says section 3 to 19, so 4 to 18, the only that include, because he never said 3 and 19 included. And so the draftsman, to ensure that all those, those sections are included, it says sections 3 to 19 inclusive. My point is that when you're reading the Constitution, and I know that you will, as teachers, you will read it, look at the words, look at the context in it. In which it was used if it does not if the ordinary grammatical meaning does not apply then look at the context 
but words are not in these laws as Christmas tree decoration. And after Christmas, you take them down. No, they are there because they were deliberate. So these rights, section three now, section three of the Constitution lists these rights. It says um, these fundamental rights include the right to life, liberty, security of the person, and the protection of the law, freedom of conscience, freedom of movement. Someone said, Mr. Usher in Corozal, go to the free zone and they want to stop them from going to the free zone when the free zone is a part of Belize. And I said to them, if you look at section 10, you will note that section 10 provides that the parliament may make laws as it relates to national security, etc. Um, public health, for example. Can somebody say that when uh, COVID and they locked down the country and nobody could move, that was a violation of Section 10 of the Constitution, the freedom of movement. But if you look at notwithstanding, subject to whatever the words introducing the limitation in section 10 you will notice that it says if the law says if the law makes a provision for public health reasons then it shall not be deemed to be violating your right of freedom of movement so in that instance the government said here we go on a lot of people they dead because they say covid so for public health reasons we will make regulations to prohibit movement within a certain period of time. So then that would not have uh, contravened the Constitution. The right to life, which I believe is one of the most fundamental of these fundamental rights, it has limitations to suppress a riot, to suppress a mutiny. If a court uh, orders you orders the sentence of death because of a heinous crime like murder or something to that effect then and the time frame for your appeals shall have not been exhausted and you are sentenced to dead to death until you are dead 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 i do not know why the tree dead because you can't get dead than the first dead but for some reasons when i read the whole cases it says you are sentenced to death until you are dead, 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 like you can be deader than dead, but nevertheless. <laughs> and then the security of the person, the right to assemble, the right to join an association, the right for you to join an association, but you cannot be compelled to join an association. For many years, persons were compelled for the loss of a better word to join the bar association and then some liar decided the constitution say i have my freedom to join or not join and so the supreme court the jealous or the high court now i'm sorry it is the constitution was amended to to include the high court rather than the supreme court so our supreme court is now the high court the, the high court had uh, decided that no persons cannot be compelled to join an association you can join if you wish so the constitution provides for that the freedom of religion i just mentioned it the right to join a religion leave a religion come back to the religion propagate your religion you have that right but there are certain limitations in the constitution if your religion is not a religion that is recognized and the court will decide whenever any constitutional issue arises the court decides whether who is right as it relates to that and the court being the jealous guardian of the constitution would leave what it has do, to do today if a motion comes a constitutional motion and deals with that because that is a very important issue a constitutional issue now 
When we look at these rights with Section 3 to 19 inclusive, one of my students in one of my public law classes said, but then are just words, Mr. Oda, a whole lot of words. Yes, they're beautiful, right of life, right to this, right to the next, but are those words. What if somebody violates my rights? Well, that is where the very famous section 20 comes in that I mentioned to you. And section 20 says, and I paraphrase, I, because I cannot regurgitate it verbatim, it says, where a person, pause there, where a person, yes, we need to pause. Why? Because it does not say where a citizen. Because it, if, if it had said where a citizen, you see why words matter. If it had said where a citizen, then why a person where a chetomal with the country, chill out the Belize, if police bully reg you um, unreasonably, you can't say nothing because you don't know a citizen. So it starts where a person, any person, whether you're the immigrant when you got your papers, whether you're the citizen, whether you're the tourist, a person, and that makes sense, protects everybody in the country. If they had said where a citizen, that excludes all these people who are not citizens. So it says where a person alleges we are passed there again. As soon done, just bear with me. Where a person alleges, so two important words right in another phrase. Where a person, anybody whether in the country, okay, your status, immigration, or wise or the other, alleges. Why? Why would why would they stop the alleges? Because you don't have to prove it. Where a person alleges that any of his constitutional rights between sections 3 to 19 inclusive has been, is being, or is likely, we have to stop that or is likely too. We have to look at these words, or is likely. That means your constitutional rights no have to get uh, contravened or abridged or abrogated yet where a person believes that any of his constitutional rights has been in the past, is being in the present, or is likely to be contravened, that person may appeal to the Supreme Court or the High Court for redress. The students say, well, Mr. Osha, thanks for explaining that to me. Because people believe that you don't got no protection of your constitutional rights. You know how many liars make money off of people's rights being violated? by others, we know I call no name, lest we offend somebody. But where your constitutional right has been con abridged, abrogated, contravened, violated, you have redress, section 20 of the Belize Constitution. So, in the interest of time, I think we could pass there. We are like two hours behind in our agenda. And what I am going to do now is if you have some longing or some standing questions in your mind as it relates to these fundamental rights, this right to life, right to personal liberty, right to privacy, freedom of movement, if you have any um, questions that relates to these, then um, you can ask them. Yes, I want to mention one more um, issue as it relates to one of your rights, your fundamental right, the right to freedom of conscience, which includes, like I said, your religion. When the PCC, this PCC, when this People's Constitutional Commission, two more minutes, this is important, to show you how it works. When this Peace People's Constitutional Commission was organized and had its first meeting, it had a document that the, that the persons who were part of the commission, the 26 members, had to sign that they would not divulge information in the meetings or whatever what the requirement was. There was a document to sign and it says, I will not do this, so help me God, or words to the effect. 
And one person said, I know the sign that because I no believe in a, the swearing to God. I no believe in a, that. And the question arose as to what should have happened. And rightfully, the question went to the uh, AG's ministry and it came back that it is in the Constitution. The Constitution provides in the, the section that deals with freedom of conscience that you cannot be compelled to swear any oath. You can make an affirmation. I was a magistrate for 15 years and the Mennonites no swear. They have some people who no swear. The Mennonites come and say, Your Honor, I no, we no swear. I say, well then, the Constitution provides that you can make an affirmation. And so he said, okay, well I affirm, I say today solemnly that I will tell the truth. Not so help me God, because he does not believe that and the Constitution makes provision that you do not have to. So when you think that these are just words, sometimes when it really comes to light, you see the teeth, the power, the robustness, and the muscular reaction of the Belize Constitution. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for being here. And I will try to answer some of your questions. Thanks. Just before I introduce the moderator of this session, Mr. Usher has to leave. I just wanted to let you know that this is the most important part of the sessions where we get to hear your voices. We harvest those voices and document them and then we put them into thematic committees and see how your concerns match an issue in the Constitution. Your questions need not be constitutional questions. Anything that is on your mind, what Mr. Usher spoke about, or what you believe in your community, in your school, um, in your country. This is the time we ask you to speak. This session will be moderated by Vice Chair, Mr. Glenfield Dennison. Glenfield is proud to be born, raised, and a resident son of Belize City's South Side. He's a public servant by passion, an attorney by profession, and here we go again, a farmer by preference. So there are three farmers at the head table. Glenfield started his public service career in 2009 as the fisheries inspector. He has worked in legislative drafting as a drafting assistant, and since June 2021 has been working as a Crown Counsel in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, where his most rewarding role is Chair of the Staff and Welfare Committee. Glenfield is a trade union Congress of Belize representative on the People's Commission, and in December 2022, he was elected from among the PCC commissioners to be the vice chair by an 80% overwhelming vote. Ladies and gentlemen, por favor, ayudarme a presentar Glenfield Dennison. Un aplauso, por favor. Morning, everyone. I want to use the least tool to kind of shot, right? Thank you very much for paying attention to Mr. Usher's presentation. The hope is that it starts to th uh, trigger thoughts. It starts to provoke questions in your mind about the type of country that you want, the things that are important to you that you want to leave as your legacy for the next generation. The Constitution is really about making Belize a better place, not just for us, but for the next generation. And until that next generation decides to rewrite their constitution what we leave with them is going to be what guides the country that they have so this part of this conference today is about you guys
telling the PCC what issues you have that you feel the Constitution can address. We have assistants around the room with microphones. If the assistants can raise their hands with the microphones, we have two in front and three in the middle. Two in the middle. If you have a question, if you have a concern, if you have a suggestion that you would like to make, it does not need to be addressing, you don't need to know a particular section in the Constitution to address us today. You are thinking people who have been contributing to this country's development, and what we want to do is to listen to what you have to say about your ideas for making the country better. What will happen from that is we take note of all of your questions, queries, concerns, and we feed that into a committee that will group those concerns and then find the areas of the Constitution that need to strengthen or be amended to reflect your views. It is also possible that your views tell us that we need an entirely new constitution. But we need to hear from you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open the floor now for any questions, comments, and suggestions? If there, if there are no questions, then I want us to, I want us to start to think. I want us to open up our minds. I went to primary school, high school, and I had some great teachers who helped me to understand the framework of the Constitution. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that I was learning constitutional law. I just made a try again, gold star upon social studies. But the, when the teachers are telling you, you have three branches of government, the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, what is in the National Assembly, the legislature is made up of the House of Representatives. You have to know that 39, well, back then they had less because I got to primary school long time. Um, and the Senate have so many senators, which reminds me, the teachers of this country did something extremely great for Belize. The 13th senator, somebody say, if Uno never go up on the street, give Uno self a round of applause for that. <laughs> Big up Uno self. If Uno never go up on the street, we know me I got a 13th senator. And I want to be, I want to talk to somebody calling the mic on um. So, if, if you don't, appreciate what's happening with the 13th senator um, it shifted the power balance in the upper house so that a government does not have the majority to be able to pass a law in the lower house and pass one in the upper house so that is the type of thinking that is the type of reform that the teachers help to trigger if you have a question and you don't want to come up please just raise your hand so that we can bring the mic to you we have someone in the center here. Someone, okay. Yes, sir, acknowledge the gentleman in the front to the far left. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Valentin Gonzalez. And before I continue, Mr. Chairman, I didn't mean to be rude, but I do accept your apology. It means a lot to me. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop me anytime I go along, because I go along until I say what I say. 
Um, I want to first of all join my voice to those people who want to keep in the preamble which the words that says acknowledging the supremacy of God. That's, I want to begin there first of all. I want to see that continued in our constitution. I am a Christian. I am a Christian first and then a Baptist. I am a pastor also and a teacher. And so I would pray that that stays there. Of interest to me, of course, has always been the discussion. People say, which God? Honestly, for me, it's Jehovah God. Um, I don't really get into the discussion of which God it is. When they say a capital G there is the God of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph for me. Um, and I do not fear uh, um, forcing that on somebody because there's another section that says freedom of religion and all that stuff. So I think everybody is free there. But I think uh, it's very important to keep, as somebody said, I think Mr. Usher said that, um, or somebody mentioned the you know, God and the role of that, that part there. In the, for me, that's very important. It, it gives us some kind of um, moral thing to go back to. If not, where do we go back to? I do not believe just going back on what humanity is doing, because if we are sincere, humanity isn't elevating itself. Uh, we're not evolving at all. We're getting worse. So we can't go back to just humanity. So that's my first um, contribution. I would pray that that stays there and the other stuff along that part. And I'll just quickly, I'm using the, your, your, I'm referring to your, your, your booklet. Um, the next one that says respect the principle of social justice, and I jump, it says economic system must result in the material resources of the community begin being so distributed so as, to absorb, so as to subserve the common good. And my, I had a, a question there. I said, what is it in the Constitution that ensures that happens? And what happens if it is not occurring, like punishment or consequences? And I'm just asking that because it's, um, it says the econo economic system must result in the material resources of the community being so distributed as to subserve the common good. And I think right now in Belize, that not happen. Okay? But what is there to uh, ensure it happens, or at least try to make sure it happens? And if it isn't happening, are there any consequences or anything addressed there? Um, i just go through and then and quickly so I can stay the whole while. <laughs> um, I had another question with the freedom of movement. And I, the whole Maya land rights thing, how does that affect? And that's my, I don't know. I, 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 sometimes I wonder people... I wonder if I go into a Maya village and, and with the land rights thing coming up, how does that affect freedom of movement? The other one with schools, it says, um, it's on page five, I should refer to the page on page five. Religious communities may establish, maintain, and manage places of education at their own expenses. How is that going? Because he's saying religious communities may establish, maintain, and manage places of education at their own expense. Is that referring to private schools or is that our church state system? And could it be why we have this struggle in the church state system because the church doesn't have the money to maintain these, these um, educational institutions, right? Uh, soon done. I, I don't know. This one isn't clear to me, but I'm just asking for clarity and maybe you could help me understand. Page 9, I'm referring to, with respect to the environment, peace and security, no retroactive criminal laws or retroactively increased punishments. I was wondering about what does that mean? Um, I'm just thinking because, because there are no retroactive things, some people get to it, a lot of things too, right? And then I have a big concern here. No person shall be entitled on the provision, page 11, of this part to be a citizen of Belize or be granted citizenship of Belize if such person shows any allegiance to or is a citizen of a country which does not recognize the independence, sovereignty, or territorial integrity of Belize. And I ask myself, I know a lot of Guatemalans who have Belizean citizenship. So, I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense. You're saying on paper and there's reality out there, right? And page 12. A general election of members of the House of Representatives shall be held at such time within three months after every dissolution of the National Assembly as the Governor General acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister shall appoint. What about a fixed date for elections? A fixed date for elections. 
Um, <clears throat> the then page 12 still, the government shall have and maintain at all times majority ownership and control of a public utility provider. And I'm confused because one time, wasn't it like BTL owned by somebody else or, or, or um, the, the, the electricity company, BEL? Haven't these things been like owned by other companies or stuff? I'm not sure. But I'm just saying this is saying in the constitution that the government should have the majority um, ownership and control, which to me makes sense, no? Which to me it says, it makes sense, but I wonder if I've missed something, because I think throughout no. the years I've seen that. Okay. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank, thank you for the questions. I, I want to just ask for in the future that we have a discussion in, that would help us to not miss any of your issues. Um, I want to say that, uh, start from the last one, um, the government ownership of public utilities is a recent amendment to the Constitution, so that's, that exists now going forward. Um, I missed some of them, Guatemalans. So the way that provision works is that that, that provision is there indeed. No one who acknowledges the, uh, does not acknowledge the sovereignty of territorial integrity of Belize of which Guatemala qualifies, but there, there, is a, there is an entitlement to be a citizen of Belize if your parents, your mother or your father, both of your parents were born Belizeans and then you were born in Guatemala. And so in relation only to that provision, there, there's a exception where the minister in certain circumstances and those are laid out under the Constitution can grant citizenship to those. Now, I know for a fact that there may have been a time where it wasn't being applied properly. That's, that's an, another question, but there is that provision that's there. Um, no retroactive criminal laws. That one is very important because th that's an entire constitutional law lecture. It's about laws that look backward and, and forward. Uh, the idea behind restricting those is that you don't want to criminalize someone for doing a behavior that was normally their behavior um, and you make it, uh, so they were doing it all along and then you then bring in this law saying as of 20 years ago so then you have to look for all those people who were, those people you put them at risk who were all committing this crime. And then, yeah, uh, <laughs> and then you punish them for it in the past. Um, that's, uh, it, it can be done, but you have to make reasonable provisions when you're doing that. So that's a, a type of lawmaking that, you, that is frowned upon. It is especially, it is restricted to elevate the punishment for someone for a crime that they've already done in the past. So if tomorrow the country decides that um, murder would bring, the penalty is for murder, right? If, if that law is passed tomorrow, then if you committed murder yesterday, they can't give you the death penalty for a murder you committed yesterday because the law is at the time when you committed the murder, you were only liable for life in prison. So that's an extreme example, right? Um, but going forward, somebody who would commit that same crime tomorrow, the, would the punishment would change for them so that you have notice of what the country's policy is going forward. Um, Mr. Usher has some comments that yes. he wants to add. Yes, so um, if I remember, yeah, make a bring the microphone Lee, closer. So <clears throat> the Constitution itself provides for what Mr. Dennison is saying. If you look at the section, section 6, subsection 4 of the Constitution, it says a person shall not be held guilty of a criminal offense on account of any act or omission that did not at the time it took place 
constituted a crime. For example, adultery. Adultery is an ecclesiastical offense in the Bible. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, look at it this way. Let's see it today or tomorrow the government says any person who is um, guilty of adultery shall be subject to five to ten years imprisonment. And it said, and this of this law shall come in, shall be deemed, now next word we're going to talk about, shall be deemed to have come into effect in 2000. That means any, any man will commit adultery between 2000 and now, and they could prove it by that one crime. So that is what the law, the constitution say, here we go, Abbas, you can't do that. So, it is, so if they make a law, that, a criminal law that makes it retrospective, then it will be unconstitutional. So some people argue, well, but the, the um, constitution itself, I think at section 67 or 68, says that the government can make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of the country. Yes, but those laws cannot find itself a fall of the constitution and the constitutional rights. One other thing before we go to, to the gentleman's question as it relates to, um, well, that was retroactivity. He mentioned rightfully, no person tried for a criminal conference shall be compelled to be a witness. But what I want to, um, the page of the book that the gentleman um, was at for that was page nine. Page nine, the um, third bullet from the bottom. No person, for, no person tried for a criminal offense shall be compelled to give evidence at the trial. And then that was, sub, it says subsection 64, that is, on, that is, on, is not correct. It is section 66. Six. So 66, six. section 6, subsection 6, just for factual clarity. It says, so why is that? Because it goes back to what Mr. Dennison mentioned, allegation, I mean, if somebody allege, when the prosecution brings you to court, they bring you to court because they allege that you committed an offense and they are going to try to prove it. But you are, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty or you plead guilty. So if you are alleging against me, he who alleges must, must prove. He, you say I would commit one crime, well prove it. Prove it, boss. The Constitution guarantees that. You cannot be compelled to give testimony. There's a similar provision in the American legal system. If you look at your movies, you will see when the policeman in America arrests somebody, they say, you're under arrest, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say will be used against you, you have the right to an attorney, um, etc. But you cannot be compelled, they say you have a right to remain silent. The Miranda case in America, the famous Miranda case, the Arizona case with Miranda, many years ago, the Supreme Court of America said no. The only way the man can say something, but some people like sing like canary, as soon as they're arrested, they sing like canary. Every liar, including Mr. Dennison, will tell you no. When the police arrest you, and the police say you're under arrest, but you could say something, not say nothing, you have a constitutional guarantee not to say anything. So when it says here at 6-6, six, six, you don't have to give evidence. As a matter of fact, that follows you right through the trial. When the magistrate like myself, I was a magistrate for 15 years, when the prosecution, Mr. Dennison said, you're under the prosecution rest, the prosecution will offer no further evidence. It is the duty of me, the magistrate, to say, okay, sir or ma'am, you hear the prosecution basically said they're done. They don't got the York then case done. No, I am obligated by the constitution, by law, because I have to tell you that you have three things, three, three, three options at this point. You have the right to remain silent still. At no point can you be compelled to give evidence. 
which will be giving evidence against your own self. Like that you, they accuse you. I know me, they accuse me, boss. That you bring me up. The only way I can give evidence is if I waver the right. Do you understand your right, sir? Yeah. You want to say anything? And then sometimes they tell me, no. I they try to tell her, <clears throat> no, no say nothing. I they try to cough and tell them, boy, no say nothing. Because, especially if the prosecution case weak, uh, and you say, well, your honor, yeah, I want to say something. I want my day in a court. And I say, you hear the, cons you hear the prosecution case? Yes, my honor. You hear it good? I hint to you, yes, my honor. And you still, but I want to get my day in a court. You do not have to say anything. You cannot be compelled to be a witness against yourself. So thanks for that observation, Pastor. Um, but it's, the correction is section 6, subsection 6. And uh -huh. one final thing. Uh -huh. Last time, I think the, either Corozal or Rohingya, somebody made a discuss, well, the right to vote. This one, you're ticklish. A lot of people disagree um, with me, and I, I, I know mine, I know perfect, but I have an opinion about that. The right to vote. Everybody say, I got my right to vote. How many people believe here that the right to vote is a fundamental right? Let us say. How much you want to think that one fundamental right to vote? That one fundamental right. Okay, so a majority don't believe it, and that means the majority there with my opinion. No. Why am I saying that you do not have a fundamental right to vote? Well, first of all, where are your fundamental rights found? They are found in part two, section three to 19, inclusive. Where are your right to vote there? Section 92. Section 92, we at the back. If it were indeed a fundamental right, we pay me on the in a part two, in your fundamental rights. So that's the first thing. That my first criticism. I am not saying, however, so not go say Mr. Osha say that you no believe it will be a fundamental right. Come on, say on a liar. But it should be a fundamental right. I know have no argument that if you all believe it, that could be a recommendation to the PCC. Where the right to vote, they don't wear a section 92. That's the first quarrel where I have with that. The second issue I have with it is this. In, in part two, it says at section 20, every person, every person, remember I tell you, remember them words? Section 92 say what? Every citizen, every citizen or every commonwealth citizen that has been living in Belize within a particular framework or a free, uh, certain condition president can vote in Belize not every person because if you if you don't want tourists and the pass through and when you pass through elections they vote you could just go vote then next all the conditions president for you ban you have the right to life for you ban the right to vote you have to be a citizen of Belize you have to be at least 18. You have to go register. You have to register in a division where you live. And you only can vote in that division there, except by proxy, the exception. Look how much condition precedent. How many condition precedent for your fundamental right to freedom of conscience? For your ban? For your ban, you got freedom of conscience. For your ban, you got freedom of religion. When I'm a three months old, my parents drag me in a St. Ignatius church. I'm Christian me, I'm Catholic. So for your ban, you have your freedom of religion. Your parents could carry you and, and, and make you be a part of a religious organization. For the right to, to freedom of movement, you don't have to 18. But for this big right where everybody, they say, I got a right for both, boss. And so what I'm saying is, if you look at the right to vote under those lights, out of those points, you might say, you know what, you yeah, don't have a fundamental right yet. It is a section 92, and it's not found between sections 3 to 19. So I just thought I would address that as it came to mind, and um, I go back to the moderator, Mr. Th Dennison. Th thank you for that, Mr. Usher. I, I just want to clarify that in Mr. Usher's example, 
if adultery became a crime, it would have to also apply to women committing adultery because we, you can't get discriminated against based on gender. Just to clarify, a law like that would have to apply to man and woman if you want to date me. All right, good. Do we have... Sir, I, I'm, I, I acknowledge that we may have missed some of your questions, but I, we want to get people participating so that we can have a discussion. I know they have to talk to you. I want to hear from you. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to acknowledge the members of the table. I am Otilio Munoz. I'm a teacher, and I'm also a justice of the peace. Um, and as, I heard, as you heard, justice of the peace, well, I have a problem with the judicial system, right? With the judicial system, um, we, know how, we do have um, that we should appreciate the, the, the judiciary because of its independence. Even though you have that word independence, we, do still, we still have political interference from the people in governing our nation, like politicians. Which I have heard many times that somebody is arrested and when I hear Mr. J.P. Guevara Ada from up there, make the release the man, make the man go. These are very typical situations in our country. And so that is one of the things that I would really want to, to the, the Constitution um, to, to, to look at it, right? That's one. The second thing is that in Belize, you are not guilty until... Sir, sorry, I, I, I want to touch one issue at a time. Sorry. Okay. So just to be clear, right? You've identified a problem with the judicial system. So is it that you're suggesting that we need to strengthen it? Strengthen it. Strengthen the judicial system right. Right. and reduce the, the power of the other side to interfere. Right. Those are your two suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to, to provoke the thought that we have also had the suggestion of maybe creating some sort of fund or some sort of requirement that the judiciary has a specific like a amount that the government has to assign to it um, as one of the ways we can curb that I, I only say that to suggest to request from you if you have any other thoughts about how we can strengthen it that is I don't know I, no, I don't no problem that, there is, that, that is a problem but but it needs to be addressed because so, then it, we cannot continue that and that same road, right? So Another, reduce the power of, of who, who of are you suggesting? Because then we have the different um, branches of government. Then we who are, are you having... suggesting interferes? Thank you. All right. right. So, okay. So reduce the power of ministerial. The ministerial in... people in power here, yeah, ministers of government. Which thank thank to you. The other branch, right? I got your point clear. Okay. The second one is that. Um, as, I, as I said, in Belize, our constitution says that you are not guilty until proven guilty, which give you the right to for a trial and a fair trial and etc. Um, we have to be realistic. In Belize, we have borders to Guatemala and, and Mexico. We do have a lot of murders uh, of committed in, in crime is high in Belize. Regardless, and I respect, and I'm not in a political thing here, politicians will say otherwise, right? That is going down. But the, the, the real thing here is that if you have somebody, a family member being murdered, right? Um, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are not guilty yet. Likewise, in Mexico, you are guilty until you prove that you are not guilty. Whenever, because of that nature in Belize, it gives you the opportunity to run through botes, Mexican side, illegal, and you forget about Belize and the crime, the loved one and the people who are hurt, you stay right there because the person have run away. So I think that that is another, another problem with concern, right? My concern about that one. Okay. Right? That so, I think that we need to change that. So the problem that you're identifying is that those who are accused of crimes are leaving the jurisdiction yeah. or are capable of leaving the jurisdiction. Yes, and they run away, they go, and, they just and, disappear. And that brings down the chance of justice yes, from the justice, family. Exactly. Yeah. 
And then another, <laughs> another point that I want to look at. We have the um, we do have the um, the different branches of government, right? Um, I I heard um, I think it's you, you applauded right the 13th senator that the teachers union you know, we fought for that one, but I strongly believe that it is time for Belize to have elected senators, not appointed, because we still have a majority of people from the party that is in governance will always outnumber the rest, right? No, no. And we, we do have the we, senators who we, are the the one from the um, civil society and, and the labor and the and the business still no right? i feel like i don't know and i want and to clarify i want to clarify okay there are 13 senators yes six are appointed by the party that's in power yes the other seven seven more than six the other seven three are appointed by the opposition and the other four are appointed by the social partners. Right. So that's what I meant when I said okay. that together there's a majority of the the government of the day does not have a majority, a majority. in the I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, I, well, I still feel like it is not working for our country. I believe that um, it should be the uh, senator should be elected because you now our constitution provides that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 that's my fault. That's my fault. <laughs> I thought it was the time. <laughs> okay. As I was saying, um, we do have, we do have the, um, the, 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 um, the, our constitution, our, 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 our how we are governed, says that um, um, a person from a senator can be a minister of cabinet. You have the freedom to move a person who was not duly elected by the people to hold a ministerial power to, to, to be a minister of whatsoever, right? How can you have somebody who was not duly elected and then the ones who are duly elected, they don't have a ministerial power? Well, because our constitution allows it, and that is what it is, right? I mean, briefly. Some change have to be done for me. That's my opinion. My humble opinion. B before we come off as senator, <laughs> I want provoke. I like provoke that, right? Okay, go ahead. So, so you say you want elected senate, elected senator, right? Yes. Hear me now. Hear me now. Listen, you want to follow me, good, right? <laughs> so, I, in a situation like we have now, where there was an election and we get a super majority in the house, right? If we have an elected senate. I want you to think about the formulation that you want for elected senate and when you would want the elected senate elections to be because if you get a super majority in the, in the house and you in the house of representatives and then you just want a full elected senate you get a super majority in the senate then everything could pass i just the provoke thought so is it that you want us to be careful of, of what, like, I always tell people in constitutional reform, it's important to think so that you don't create a situation that makes it worse, yeah. right? Okay. So I just, just wanted to throw that out to you. And, and, Mr. And, Mr. Usher wants sorry, to comment on that one. Yes, I just want to um, address the, where you said that somebody could leave could abscond, could go, right. and then right. no. But the Constitution provides um, for ex parte. So if you, if, the, if you do not show up to court for whatever reasons, then the, um, you abscond or whatever, the court under the Constitution can have an ex parte trial. Mm -hmm. So the, the, if the Constitution the right, guarantees that. And then you mentioned about the separation of powers. Uh, basically, you are saying that if you are a senator, then you should not be able to be a, min, um, a minister, member of cabinet, cabinet or whatever. Well, that is something that I noticed the um, chairman had written down, which is an interesting point. And 
we I also heard the uh, election of senators. They're supposed to be elected. Then we are looking at a different system. So you are, I don't know if you know, if you notice because you did not see it, but you are looking now at perhaps, you are perhaps discussing republicanism. Because the American system, as it relates to the, to the Senate or the cabinet, you cannot be a member of the United States cabinet, the president's cabinet, if you are a member of Congress. So if you are a member of the House in America, or you are a member of their Senate, you can't be a member of the cabinet. Exactly. So you are looking at, you are delving in, even maybe not intentionally, you are delving into a new era now, whether you are talking about Another republic. Right. So okay. I just wanted to mention, to mention okay. that. Okay, and another thing, the last thing in my, in my, in my um, thing um, is just, uh, it is just something to think about. Um, we do have that you have the right to vote. That's a fundamental right. Now, if, it is a, if we have in our constitution that it's a fundamental right, um, let to, um, if this brings a question to my mind, which I don't know, and I need clarity, and I need to know because I'm a teacher, um, and I'm always asked, right, when I teach about this, how are the prisoners? Does the prisoners have the right to vote for election? And, and then they, they ask me, sir, can they vote? And I just say, well, they are in prison. They don't have no right again because I don't know. So I need to get that clarification because then we do have that they have the fundamental right to vote. So that is the, what deprived them because they are already in a prison. So they don't have that fundamental right again. Um, with that, I end. Thank you very much. T <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, just, just to clarify, um, teacher, just to clarify, you do not have a fundamental right to vote. And the right that's given to you to vote is at Article 92 of the Constitution. And you have a right to vote in certain circumstances one of those circumstances other than what um, mr usher has mentioned is that the representation of the people up can spell out what are the criteria that you would disqualify you That's from voting and one of them one of those disqualifications under the representation of the people Act is if you're currently serving a term of imprisonment so yeah, that is what disqualifies the prisoners from voting right but under the constitution it says at and this is only at general elections that you have a right to vote right so that's how you address it that the constitution is not a fundamental right it's a right that's given at general elections subject to several qualifications and one of them representation of the people up can lay out more details the things that can disqualify you that's how prisoners are disqualified from voting. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Sylvia Marin, San Esteban, RC School. Um, I want to first of all begin acknowledging the head table. Thank you for making this possible. And I would appeal and request that you come back to us to show the draft of the revised constitution before it is made law. Because right now, you are informing us of something that is happening, that is already that is in place. And we want to see and be active participants in whatever else happens before it makes it, make it to legislation. And I really would want that to be put. Come back to us. We will be waiting. The Green Machine wants to see. The second point that I want to... Thank, wait, sorry. I just want to clarify, right? Yeah. The, under the Constitution, we elected the people that will make the law, right? Yes. That's under the Constitution. The, they form the cabinet, yeah. right? And then the cabinet, Run. and through the legislature, formed us, yes. the PCC. So what we are doing is the consultation process to make recommendations of the changes the people want, 
right? So that demand is technically not for the PCC, it's to the members of the House of Representatives for telling, we don't want to touch the Constitution, we don't want to go on a draft, we want to come back to we, for me to tell we just want to clarify that to you. The green machine needs to set that to, the, it's not us, what we will do is we will continue the consultation process, but just to be clear, that now we are write the law, we are make the recommendations that you say you want in it, um, but if I can help you to frame it, we can make a suggestion that any constitutional amendments requires a public consultation. Is that what you're saying? Yes. All right, good. Yes. We need to see it before it becomes law. And so I'm asking you if that's a suggestion you want yes. to make, that any constitutional change comes to a comes public to consultation. That's, yeah. that's your recommendation. Yes. Yes, Thank you. The one part as an educator that I'm very concerned and amazed was to see that education was not a part of the fundamental rights. Um, at our last consultation with our Sherry Carls, I was advocating that education become a uh, part of our fundamental rights. However, I want to, to ask uh, whether if education becomes a fundamental right, what are the pros and the cons of this? I think we had a little discussion about that. Uh, whether that would conflict with our right to, to, uh, to strike. Uh, you know, whether we will be, if education be a fundamental right, then it would conflict with my other rights. So we would want to see whether that is solvable or what would outweigh if it is if it becomes, if education becomes a fundamental right, then would that prioritize, become a priority over my right to, to strike or my right to be out of the classroom? What, what do you think? Uh, and uh, wait, wait, can, so, can no, there no, be, no, because no, right wait, now we have... Uh, wait, right, I want to ask the green machine. Uh -huh. What do you think? Green machine, want to think anything could trump for the right to strike? Yeah, but I, I another, I another thing is that you see, probably the government can use an AI and, and uh, there, there's a balance. There's yeah. a balance. So, if, if you are executing your right to strike, then someone who is claiming that their right to an education is being infringed would have to move the court to say that your striking is infringing their right to yeah. their education and it then the court would then balance those but by then you don't get a 13th senator yeah <laughs> not only that but um we were we were seeing we had discussed about we have a right to fight for rights yes right so. sorry did i clarify this there yeah. they, so that's what would happen you, you, they, they would, a student or a student body or organizations would, would lobby the court to say that your strike is now infringing on my right to an education. But I know the teachers are, the court will balance what is reasonable, and I know the teacher is not unreasonably strike. Yeah. So that's where I leave that. I can't comment any further. I can't make it in trouble. Nonetheless, I would still want that education becomes a fundamental right, and the, the word free education would also be in it. Say it again. Free, Say it, education. free education should be a fundamental, <laughs> fundamental right. right. That's my second one. The third and last one to me is most important. Um, any idea upon the level where you wanna go? At least from preschool up to what? The green machines would know. I didn't hear somebody say tertiary, I'm not sure. At least high school. At All right. Least I just school. wanted to provoke that thought. When you make these recommendations, yeah. you, can, you can frame them yeah. in different ways. So I have free education should be a fundamental right. So that's your... All right. The last one that I would want to tell is that we have been promoting and talking about anti-corruption laws. The anti-corruption laws. 
I would really want to see that the committee sits and merges this, these, um, these into the Constitution, the anti-corruption laws. Why? Because I am perusing to this, and I believe that our brother Otilo also touched on it, and the brother Valentin, uh, on the ministerial power. We can see that in page 11. You know, it has the ministers, oh, the ministers have reserved the, the discretion, the ministerial discretion. Whether it is that ministers will have that discretion, I believe that the constitution should spell out the limitations on on these on these um, on this power on this, these discretions. So I believe that they need to be spelled out if it is to stay. I would rather have it removed, you know. So I, I'm appealing that the table sits, looks at the anti-corruption laws, and merges in, it into the. And I believe that once that is done, I mean, you would really be serving our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, just, teacher, just to clarify, you see the man in the white shirt with the blue stripe? Yeah, he and contact this afternoon about governance, right? That's the director of good governance. So, not free to look shot this afternoon, right? Test one, two, three. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Good Pleasant morning. good morning. My name is Enrique Ayuso. I am from Orange Rock. I am just going to request, since we are doing constitutional reformation, my concern is some wording in our national anthem. Anytime I have to sing the anthem, I pause at certain times because I think carefully what it is that I am pronouncing. And I refer specifically to two areas. Um, in the first verse, I think it say, uh, says, Arise ye sons of the Bayman's clan. Um, that song was originally composed for a small group of people. I don't feel that that rightfully represents the entire country. So diverse and so secular, as was mentioned earlier. So that wording has to change. Arise ye sons of the Bayman's clan. I always ask myself that question when I'm singing the anthem. Am I a son of the Bayman's clan or am I not? Then in the third verse it says, Our fathers, the Bayman, valiant and bold, drove back the invader, this heritage hold. True for one sector of our country, but this conference is in Corozal. Corozal, where we are right now, we are not too far from Santa Rita where it was the headquarters of ancient Chetomal, where Nachancan, with the help of Gonzalo Castillo, I mean Guerrero, with the help of Gonzalo Guerrero, they were driving away the invaders of Spanish invasion over land. And that is not being recognized in the anthem. It says, our fathers, the Bayman, valiant and bold, drove back the invader, this heritage hold. I think our Maya in the north did drive back um, a lot of the invasions that came over the Rio Hondo border. It's not included or acknowledged anywhere in the anthem. So, so, so I think that the wording has to be changed to include everyone so that we could feel a part of it. So our fathers the Bayman, we have to probably ch change it to our, our fathers of the land or our fathers of the soil or something like that. Because then we need to feel included as part of the anthem. Anytime I personally sing the anthem, I would go silent on certain sections or make pauses. That's for my own personal thing because I am reflecting on said words that are, that are being pronounced. So maybe it's not directly in the fundamental rights, but since it's part of, of, of reforming constitution, it would be a wise thing to make certain revisions so that um, we have a greater inclusion as it is um, an anthem that is sung by every 
citizen either naturalized or somebody who has become a citizen in some other means or even visitors um, so the anthem needs to be rewarded to reflect us as Belizeans we are one Belize, Belize we are a secular country but we need to be a little bit more inclusive starting with the wording of the anthem that's my contribution thanks thank, thank you very much Yes. Good morning. Morning. My name is Mr. Inio Lopez from the Republic of Guinea Grass. Uh, One. Sorry, I, I'm putting your first suggestion is that Guinea Grass be declared a republic. I'm coming to that right now. I just need to get the notes clear. I'm coming to that. It has been proposed. First, I want to acknowledge everyone and um, appreciate what the government is doing. Because what is being done in Belize rarely is done in other parts of the world. So I appreciate what the government is doing for us because the people is being consulted so that our constitution really reflects the feeling, the thoughts of the people as a society. And I want to commend the government for this. Thank you. Um, it has been mentioned before in Parliament about the idea of changing our mode of government or the model of government. And I believe that it would be something very, very significant and very um, um, beneficial. Because if we would go and we would take half of the Westminster model and half of a republican model to try to amalgamate and form somewhat of a hybrid type of government where our prime minister or president whatever name or the title is being elected by the people that would be something extraordinary for all of us because we cannot have a prime minister who is elected only by his or her party so if we would have input in electing our prime minister or our president then we will feel that yes that prime minister was elected by the people of belize so that is one concern one proposal that i have and i have others i don't know if you want to comment on this or yes. i should go along so that's that's an interesting provision i want to invite people to look right in caricom we have we have such models Guyana has a type of hybrid system. They elect their president, countrywide elections, and their parliament is elected by like districts. And it's a proportionate representation system too. So that they're not like if minister from if a, if an era rep from Corozal B wins by one vote, he comes in parliament. But if uh, minister from Corazal North wins by 3,000 votes, he gets one seat in parliament. What they do is they add up all the votes that each party gets, divide it by the amount of seats that they have in parliament, and then you get that proportion. So there, there are lots of models out there. Um, I made the note that you want us to consider a hybrid model. Um, you made the suggestion of an elected prime minister. Um, the, is it can I do I have your permission to extend it to have us look at not just the Prime Minister being elected but a president where do you want me to go with that is it that you want our current system where the Prime Minister has to have a second ballot how, how are you in because it, it, it there's a lot of details that would have to be worked out um, yes, I understand that there are other details and other dynamics and other things that has to go with it. But, but the idea, the concept is elected. The Prime concept is, is the concept that you want the person who is the head of the cabinet to be elected from the people of Belize. Is that the concept? So whether you call it president, whether you call it prime minister, is that what you're saying? Yes. The person who makes the big decisions. Yes. The one the he elected from the whole country. 
Exactly. I, I got you correct. Yes. All right. Okay, point number two. Do you care if he's prime minister or president? Just well, the person, whatever the title whoever that is. Elected by the people. That is the essence. Okay, point number two is that um, I see ministers of government, parliamentarians, and it um, gives me sort of shame to a certain extent to know that some ministers are not qualified for a position. So, my point in this regard is that no minister can run for office or no person can run, no citizen, that is the word, can run for office without a proper academic qualification. Okay. And this, this is as, how are you envisioning it working? Because remember, we vote for era representatives right now. So, however... No, 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 I'm, I'm coming to that in my third question. Ho right? House, House of Representatives people or cabinet people with a top vote? I am speaking about any standard bearer who will pose his or herself as a candidate to run for office should must have at least an associate's degree so that the person knows what he or she is doing or higher academic qualification because you can't have a minister um, um, administering a, a health or education or any other ministry with no qualification or, or, ju or just a high school diploma. Okay, I, I heard you say associate's degree and I heard the green machine say something else. I, I just need to get my notes correct. They're saying higher, higher qualification. But I am putting it at least an associate's. It should be higher. Yes, Mr. Chanona. Okay, um, okay. I and um, I would. Okay, I, teachers, please. I would quell. just. I would just like to point out one thing that. Section 1, Section 1 of Part 1 of the Belize Constitution then would have to be amended because Section 1 says the first section of this first section that creates this whole Belize, it says Belize shall be, shall means in Allah have to. May discretion shall is mandatory. Belize shall be a sovereign democratic state. Democracy, as a teacher, you know, democracy, demo, government by the people, of the people, for the people. And if we start, um, the idea was listening to a radio show in the morning, and someone was referring to elitism in the system. If we decide now that we're going to have a certain educational level, then we are excluding a whole area of our population. And then will this stand true? Belize shall be a sovereign democratic state, not an autocratic state where one person um, runs the show, not a theocratic church, uh, state where the church runs the government. All right, well, it's time for me to go. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, this elbow. But not a theocratic state, not a kleptocratic state, a state by thieves. No, 
because you have kleptomaniacs and kleptocracy but it is to be a democratic state so i'm just saying that if we when we propose certain things and we have to look at how it will affect other areas nothing is wrong with your proposition i mean you have some good points but we have to note that when we propose certain things in the constitution we also have to look at the other part and section one says this country will should run by a democratic system so we have some people in our society who are not necessarily academically inclined but that means they're not smart so if we start to put then somebody might say well i the master so no 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 why no masters you can't run for a parliament if you don't have a masters so we kind of the tread pass on touchy line but i'm just saying to you that we have to come back to that first and that first section it shall be a democratic state that means anybody anybody could run mm -hmm. and so i'm just i'm just putting it out there um for 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 mm -hmm. us to consider because next month next month i think it's october 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 we go into the stronger phase like what you're coming with you're going hard that is in october right now we are just aligning people with what obtains in the constitution so yes. nothing is wrong with your presentation i'm just saying that when we consider one area we have to look at how it might affect a subsequent area and when it comes to the democracy i think a lot of belizeans that we don't want no other kind of crassy no kleptocracy no theocracy no we want democracy government of the people of the people whether you have one high school diploma or one bachelor's or a master's because well reality um there will be many persons who will never get uh, th those type of degrees so when we think of those systems we have to think about the other areas that it will affect so just a observation yes i am well aware that um in amending some sections of our constitution it will have ramifications in others yes so it has to be done in a manner where it, there is consistency right yes and i know you can do that all right let me proceed with my um yeah miss schumann needs to make an announcement teachers i know you will want your lunch right but the teachers who are standing at the back are keeping us from proper movement to get the lunch to you. So all teachers who are standing at the back, I need you sitting down. There are lots of chairs at the front. The food is taking long for us to set up because we can't pass. You're blocking the way. So teachers, I'm not going to move from the mic until I see clearance at the back. We need to pass 1,700 plates of food and you are blocking my way. Please. And either way, the front zone to stop me. Teachers, we will not continue until I see clearance at the back. I should only see my volunteers who are in white shirt and have a lanyard. All other teachers who are blocking the way at the back, kindly find a seat and sit down because the lunch will be given in order and we will begin with the front rows. So those who are sitting at the front will go first. All right. So my volunteers, I will ask that you stand on the side and you will indicate which row goes next for us to have proper order at the back. But teachers, please don't get up and crawl the aisle because it will just make the matter go slower. So we will start with the front rows when lunch begins, which is going to be very shortly. I still see a little crowd. Please clear the back. Thank you. Thanks. The, so, like, if you put 10 lawyers in a room, you will have, like, 11 legal opinions, right? So, 
my little two cents on that part is the Constitution already provides for qualifications and disqualifications for members of the House of Representatives. So we can also have a discussion about whether you want to amend those provisions. So it's your, your questions and comments are properly placed. Right? Just to clarify, but Mr. Usher is right that you have to be cautious how you amend those because it does have implications for proper representation of the people of Belize because you as educators should know that our population is diverse as it relates to education level and you do want to allow a, a sort of that's all I will say about that but there is there is a, I refer anyone who wants to read up more about those to look at article 58 59 um, of the Constitution and the ones for qualifications for senators as well. Okay? Um, yes. You have another comment? Yes. I we, have we have to end the question and answer session soon, right? So, yes. like, you know, line up the front if you don't go on the questions. Okay. Um, my next point, my next proposition is that um, you see, we teachers, if we are to have a teacher's license, we have to come through heavy scrutiny there are a lot of documents that we need to submit a lot including the police record and so many things and now they're coming with CPDs and so many things to be a teacher now let me transition my thought to that of a parliamentarian I would like, and I, it's my belief, that no parliamentarian can hold office, or no minister of government, or no one should sit in government with a convicted criminal record. I agree with the 11th Amendment 100%. Be it a UDP, be it a PUP, be it a green, a yellow, whosoever. You cannot hold office if you have a criminal record, especially if the criminal record is one of, of, of a high committed crime. So I would agree with the 11th Amendment, and I am here to endorse the 11th Amendment so that we can have people in parliament who have a clean record. That's for everybody across the board. And um, I would really recommend that this be entrenched and enshrined into our constitution. Lastly, taxation. Sorry. You, the note I have is if the crime is of a high nature. High profile crime, yes. Murder. The, the same considerations that Mr. Usher said earlier applies, right? Murder. Just, just to be clear, and I just want to suggest that maybe being a teacher higher than being a parliamentarian. Sorry, I just did be mischievous, no? No, um, high profile crime, murder, murder, big, big theft, drugs, big quantities, or you know, there should be a more or less an amount. Okay, also murder, drugs, theft, um, big time corruption, too. Lies right there, big time corruption, rape, all those. You can't be a parliamentarian if you are found guilty or have been convicted of this crime. It speaks bad on yourself. You have a huge baggage. Yes, there's redemption. Yes, good, genuine redemption. Good, but you can't sit there. Your redemption is okay here with your family and with your you know, close relatives and so, right? Same, okay. same criteria for teachers? Yes, yes, same, everybody. I, I like to provoke thought because just when you, you have to be, you have to know that, yes. remember, someone can then say you are discriminating against them but not other groups. Say, say example I gave with male and female, right, for adultery. Yes, um, in taxation, I want to mention that we teachers, we are being charged 25% in taxes 
income tax. And when I did a little research, I found out that there are many professionals who earn double or triple our salary and they are being charged a lesser amount in income tax. That Six. is very absurd. Uh, I pay 25, right? Just, just yes, I clear. would suggest that we... I, I, I pay 25. Just, just want to know. Yes, uh, right. I, I don't right. know which... Pro but there are professions, I it, am aware. It, yes. Okay? So I don't know if we teachers are the ones that have been hammered with a 25% income tax. If Sorry, just to clarify, are you requesting a reduction in tax or an increase in the other one? It, okay, two things. I suggest a reduction in income tax. But, but, For if they are being obstinate and they want to keep it at 25, then an increase in salary must be there. Is that, is that a or or a an first choice is a reduction in income tax reduction in income tax but if you get it you know what pay raise no no but i am saying but if government is obstinate adamant about keeping it at 25 percent for teachers then there must be an increase in salary for teachers. Okay, I understand what you say, right? And it provoke thought, right? What you have said, you want a reduction in income tax and you've hinged your salary increase request on whether or not you get a reduction in tax. So, right, so what you're saying to me is if they put it at 24.5, your salary could stay the same. That's what you've said. That's the effect of what you're saying. No, but let so me... I, so I have to ask you to no. clarify. I have to tell me. Okay, let me bring... Let me bring clarity. 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 I propose a benchmark or a threshold for us 10%. Not 25. 10% income tax. Yes. That would be more precise. Brother Dennison, yes. um, I'll make an intervention here. And since we have an audience of teachers, as is right now, the joint unions, along with government, we are negotiating taxes because we did say that we're not going to be having a discussion on pension without having a discussion on tax reform for teachers and as well as a salary scale revision. So right now that discussion is ongoing so that we can make things better for our teachers. You, you see, Ms. Schumann has to set up because I had a PCC, so I can't tell you all for us for that. I could just ask for clarify what you tell me. But so, I see some head did not want to try to ask you for clarifying and I want to grab the microphone, say some of their comments. I know they smile up and grin up when I say it. And I'll point out nobody. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I want to finish by accentuating that the referendum, which is a very important democratic way of expressing our will as a people must be binding must be binding binding because if we look at the referendum act as it stands presently it is not binding so a binding referendum and to ensure that all issues and matters of national importance for example matters of morality be put to national referendum matters of 
our sovereignty as a country be put to national referenda. Very important issues like the marijuana bill need to be put to national referendum because these are things that can either alter, affect, or destroy the national fabric, the societal fabric of a nation. So these are matters of significant importance, and I believe that these types of matters need to come to a national referendum, not parliamentarians drafting laws to enact. No, it should be the people deciding on these serious issues. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Um, yes. Okay, just two comments. Um, the last one, as it relates to referendum being binding, I think nobody would uh, argue with that one, um, even Section 1 would not argue with it, that deals with democracy, because a referendum is the closest you will get, or the purest, to a certain extent, the purest form of direct democracy. So I just wanted to say that. And then one final thing I want to say before I done, um, a very important point came up in Orange Walk, when I, when I presented it in Orange Walk. A fellow said, um, spoke to, um, the right to an attorney. Say, Mr. Osha, um, the states, when the police arrest you, he say, you are under arrest, blah, 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 and you have a right to an attorney. And I said to him, yes, you have a right to an attorney in Belize, only because Section 6 says you have a right to an attorney, but you are paid for one by yourself. So it's right in the Constitution. It says you are, have a right to your attorney, to any attorney where you are, at your own, at your own expense. So perhaps, um, and the gentleman said, well then, that is something that he wants to propose, that we have the right to an attorney at all times, just like states, as soon as you get arrested, not seeing like one canary and call for your lawyer. In, you do, the police tell you you have the right to an attorney. In Belize, you have the right to an attorney, only because you want to pay for her. So maybe um, the chairman um, is making a list of those suggestions, perhaps, that one might be suggested. It will be costly, but then it will protect those, those other rights under Section 6, the protection of the law, your presumption of innocence, your right not to be compelled to be a witness against yourself, your right to an attorney, only because you have to pay for her. Maybe they could take out the, you have to pay for her, and then you have a right to an attorney. So thanks for your, your contribution, and I just didn't want to leave here without bringing up that one, your right to counsel. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I saw some people like on real ask some questions, but like on a shy and must be hungry. We'll have another so, question and answer. So we are we are get one next stab at the question and answer a while and eat and, and get to know on a mind thinking of Constitution. So, hello. Sorry, sorry, somebody got a bike. Hi, over this side. Yeah, yeah. Take it. All right, I have permission to take the question. Okay, um, mine is not a question, mine is a concern. Um, I am a principal from the Orange Rock District, and um, platforms like these are important, and I am sensing it's extraordinarily hot in here. Um, we have two huge districts put together, and it, it's, it's hot, the noise is loud, and it's an important thing taking place, much of which I still need to understand. We could be educators, lawyers, and top officials, but the Constitution is not something as easy as one, two, three. I could stand up here and make all the recommendations but that does not cut it. I am afraid of these types of situation because then you hear on national TV that the people of Belize were consulted and the laws are now passed 
and you can't say no because you signed it at the entrance. I did sign at the entrance, but not for any laws or anything that we comment in here be passed without due process. How many times haven't bills and laws been passed and we, the Belizean public, educators and everybody, we were not made aware. So now that we are seeing the awareness, and I'm talking from my perspective, my question, is there a hidden agenda behind this? That is my concern. And I want it in record that this is not really the consultation we need. We need to go more in depth into this and come to an understanding. Why did Orange Walk have to come here? We needed this consultation in Orange Walk. The masses are too much for an understanding. Second thing I have, and educators will understand my jargon, we sat a year ago to consult through the Ministry of Education, this idea of competency base. I sat for that consultation. I had my concerns as a leader. I voiced it out. But then I was saddled on a horse to ride it without my full agreement to it. And now we are facing that situation up to today. And we stand luck cannot get the answers and clarifications. But it went on national TV that the consultations took place. Meeting me with one time and telling my schools and our teachers that this is a consultation process that um, to prepare us, there was no preparation. In fact, to my disappointment, the ministries were not even prepared for this to go through. And now who you think is facing the problem? We, the educators, we are paying the consequences of sitting in an audience like this, fanning ourselves, thinking about crossing the border very soon, and then taking the lick. So I'm just sharing my concerns and my fears. What is the agenda behind all of this? You need to educate us properly. This is not your answer. So, um, whatever is behind all of this, I applaud you to at least wanting to inform us, but I still believe a matter as serious like this, I need people to come to my school, to your staffs, and inform you. And before anything is passed, what about telling, you know, these are some changes that we are making. Sit with your staff and discuss what will come after these are passed to law. Look at the pros and cons. And then we can consult if maybe that's the way we want to go. Teachers, and for you all up there, this week and next week is the worst week to sit any teacher to do consultations. We need to be ready to enter those classrooms. And since the last consultation through the Ministry of Education, I'm entering the classroom for a second year after they say they consulted with us to continue a competency base that they themselves cannot give me clarifications for. So, thank you, thank you, I applaud you. I wish I could give recommendations, but I don't find myself fit to do that because the proper guidance and education has not come my way as yet. And when that happens, then we can talk about consultations. Right now, I should be at school trying to figure out the consultations of last year. And I have to go back and face the public, my parents, and my staff as to how are we going to move forward. And the people who consulted are missing in action at this time. Thank you, and I hope you can reach to our schools more in depth 
with this information. Thank Principal, Principal, thank you so much for your comments. I did not stop, pause when you were speaking because I will be very clear with you. This process is being driven by 23 organizations who sat and had days and days of discussions of exactly the things that you were saying. These were properly ventilated by some people who got a lot of sense, right? And <laughs> not the ministers, not the politicians, not the politicians, not the politicians at the top, but people like me, man, I don't think I got sense then. People like, people like President Schumann, like people thought exactly how we're going to do this process. And one of the first things we came up with is you can't go ask people how you want to change your constitution without have a discussion about educating about what is in the constitution. So when the chairman came up here to introduce what we were doing, we, were, we tried to be very clear that this is an educational campaign. Now, it would be remiss of us to not to assume that everybody here now have something to contribute for what they want in a constitution. And so we thought to use the opportunity to listen to those who already come prepared with suggestions. And we will record those. But this by no means is the end of our consultation process. In, 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 in fact, sorry, this, what I, when I say consultation process, I mean the consultation process for the PCC. This is the educational campaign, which would then advise and form the people, the views of the people of Belize, so that when we do the consultation, we get informed decisions. So, Principal, you are absolutely right. The, the, there, there was some, some cynicism behind it, and we tried our best to ensure that, first of all, we understood the Constitution, and then we go from there. President would like to address you guys. Yeah. I'm glad you said what you said, Principal, because it is a reflection of how we genuinely feel. When this commission was being put together, BNTU was invited to have two representatives. And the two representatives have been myself and Chantel, Sister Chantel, who is the president of Punta Gorda. The commission is comprised of various organizations around this country, from the churches, the um, trade union congress, B BNTU, PSU, UB, the youth, we have YLAB, we have the two major parties represented, we have the minor, the minority parties represented, everybody there, the Creole Council, the Maya Association, these are the types of people that make up the Medical and Dental Association. These are the people we are talking about that form the Constitution, the, um, the Constitution Commission. Now, this process, and I was the one who voiced we cannot go and ask our people what they want change if we, they don't know what it is we're talking about. The statistics show that 98% of our population had never opened the Constitution. So how can we ask them what they want changed? As is some of the topics we're talking about, kind of allude to it, but where do we really fall in the Constitution? So this that we're having right now is not consultation. We decided that for the next few months, we're going to engage in education. At the end of this education process, we're going to come back in different ways and have to have consultation where we will now hear from you. You will, in the next few weeks, be seeing ads. You are going to be 
looking at uh, TikToks and Instagram and Facebook, information is going to be all over the place. And the forums will go to every village, every office, every district, every corner of this country. But it's going to be education. After that education is done, the commission will get together and look at the data, see what came out of it, and then come back. And there will be another survey. That survey will more look at then, what is it you want? Now that you have seen, you've been flooded with information, which is what will be happening in these weeks to come and the months to come. Then consultation will happen. Somebody said earlier, we need to bind this legally so that it becomes referendum and we're not taken for fools. Teachers, we have proven over and over again that when teachers say, you will not take me for a fool, we take that stand and make sure it doesn't happen. This is very serious. This is the time to really right what has been wronged on our people. And I was one of them, and I have it in record in the minutes, who questioned the way we are going to present this report and whether this is binding enough to ensure that what the people want is put to referendum. And it's up to us to ensure that it happens. Because if you will say that you don't want this and that or you want, I for one have an issue with ministerial discretion. Are we going to then just sit there and say it's the end of the road? So no. I love that you voiced what you said. In reference to the consultation of last year, BNTU, we're going to have a meeting regarding that because that is serious business. That's a half an hour, and I, I know the chair wants to say something, but it's a forum of teachers, and be on the lookout for upcoming meetings. And I want to see this participation regarding last year's consultation. Madam President, even with her high heels, um, still needed to stand up. I just wanted to assure teachers of a couple things. One, the paper you signed there was for the registration purposes of BNTU. It is not to be used in any way, fashion, or form that you somehow were present at an event. We call it public outreach education and that somehow your signature attests for a carte blanche agreement to something that you are not aware of. So please don't associate signing up as part of a sinister plan and agenda. I would want to assure you, we're all Belizeans. We want the best for our country. We see what is happening. We have an opportunity. But what is important, Commissioner Schumann said a very important thing. There are 23 organizations within the PCC. What we have found out, that when we announce a meeting, that we're going to Orange Walk, and we're having a meeting, and we prepare for 100, 150 people, 40 people show up, we're saying, that open door invitation is not working. We want this. So we go to the stakeholder and we say to the stakeholder, we want to harvest the views of your base. That is why you were asked to scan the QR codes. A citizen survey, because that is what the PCC needs to begin to understand what you're saying. Remember something, not all of you are coming up to the podium to speak. That does not mean you do not have something to say. So we ask, and I know the Wi-Fi was difficult and there were some incompatibilities with the QR codes. A lot of people were going on to the system and it was overloaded. 
technical difficulties that we do not foresee. The most important part of today's session, in addition to all the good questions that we want to hear, is your participation in the citizen survey. What do we do with that? When you click that link, it goes to the Statistical Institute of Belize. They analyze the data and they will say to us, of the 700 or the 1,000 or the 1,400 persons that were at your session, responded to these thematic areas of concern, and this is where they are. It's a process of trying to listen to what is in your mind. That survey is what we really want to take. Because if we had ever called a meeting in Corozal or Orange Walk, or like what we did at the Swift Center in Belize City, the Creole Council, and say, come, the numbers don't show up. And for us to understand the process, we need those surveys. Those surveys go into a discussion paper on the PCC, and then we come back to you and said, you had a concern about this, we are now going to consult you about that issue. Education before consultation. It can't be consultation before education. You all are teachers. So I just wanted to ask you, please take the time and participate in that survey. It is the most important part of why we have invested almost $30,000 to get you here. This is taxpayers' money. Please, for the sake of the taxpayers, do your part, represent yourself, take that survey and let us know what your thoughts are that we can begin to design our consultation process. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Is it time for, yeah, for lunch? lunch. Yeah, my shirt, so. Thank you, Chair. All right. We will now break for lunch. There will be another question and answer series later. Um, so let's do this quickly and orderly. First row at the front, stand up, start going down the aisle and start collecting. And then you will, you will go in the middle, come back around and come back to sit. We need to move in an orderly fashion. So first row, the rest please sit. We need to move in an orderly fashion. First row. First row there, 